Welcome to our Connecting to Reimagine seminar. Today, we will talk about bringing financial education to the global stage. And I am very happy to have the CEO of Latoon International, Roland Monash, to be here with us. Aflatoon is a very impressive organization. And let me tell you a few statistics about it. They offer financial education to children and young people worldwide through a strong network of 345 partners and 38 governments. Aflatoon reaches more than 10 million children and young people each year in more than 100 countries. Congratulations, uh, Roland. And a few weeks ago, I had the pleasure to joining Roland at the summit organized at the United Nations uh, called Transforming Education, where we presented research on the effectiveness of financial education and the measurement of financial literacy. And I have to say, we said it loud and clear. Financial literacy is an essential skill to thrive in the 21st century and financial education works. And I have to say the result of the summit have been uh, uh, powerful in his vision statement. At the end of the summit, the Secretary General of the United Nations recognized the importance of financial skills, uh, which will help to bring more attention to how the world can be transformed by elevating financial literacy and financial education. So we are building a momentum for financial education and financial literacy, but we need to do more. And I want to talk to Roland about, first of all, his behind the scene work on being able to put this topic on the agenda and how you and your team and your network were able to bring financial education in the global stage. So first of all, welcome Roland. Thank you, Ana Maria, thank you for having me. Um, and uh, so, first of all, I want to say congratulations on making the financial literacy session uh, on, on the agenda of the Transforming Education Summit. Um, so I want you to share with us how you were able to put that topic on the agenda of the summit. Yeah, to be honest, it was not that easy. Uh, we, we had submitted a request to, uh, to present to the summit uh, with the organizers but the organizers didn't have uh, financial education as a session. Mm -hmm. So then we accepted and we decided to, uh, to uh, participate uh, as every other organization in, in the, 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 for the platform, which was there to discuss issues or in the run up to the Transforming Education Summit. But we realized that there was very little interaction. Uh, people were not really engaged and interested in, in other topics than their own topics. Uh, many of the people who, who were participating wanted to do more of what they were doing already, and there was very little innovation. And then we realized we need to do this in a different way, because the, the few people who did want to have a change, they were only talking about climate change and digital skills, but that was for them 21st century skills. And, and we felt we're really missing an opportunity here to, to flag the importance of financial skills uh, as a key part, as you say, of, of 21st century teaching and learning. And, Therefore, uh, we realized we need to do some do it differently, and we mobilized the network. As you mentioned, Aflatoon is a large network of organizations around the world. Uh, and what we did is we drafted uh, a letter uh, to and and uh, to send to the heads of agencies uh, responsible for education, like UNESCO, UNICEF, the World Bank, and also to the Secretary General's office. The Secretary General had appointed a special advisor for the Transforming Education Summit, and we sent a letter not by Aflatoon, but by 130 organizations from 70 countries from all corners around the world. And basically, in that letter, we basically said, transforming education without financial education is not the transformation learners are looking for. And, and in, in, the, in, the, in the blog and on our website, you can, you can see more details, but we really made a very strong case that you have to talk about uh, financial education. We cannot go into a summit and not mention the skills which are re required so, so badly. And, and uh, to our surprise, 
within a few days, we got a response from the special advisor from the Secretary General's office on, on the summit. And basically he wrote a very nice letter back to, to the network and said, you have a point. And, and interestingly, I think what triggered, uh, which got most resonation was, was the fact that everybody was talking about climate action. And we said, of course, you need to talk about climate action, but if you want to talk about climate action and you don't learn children about money, then you will never get them to, talk, to, to change the behavior for climate. You need to look at it in a broader perspective from responsible resource management. So you need to know how to close the tap, how to deal with your, uh, your, uh, uh, your environment. But if you don't learn to, to learn how to use money uh, to deal, take care of yourself and uh, your environment, it will never work. So suddenly, very few after we got that response from the Secretary General's advisor, we got an invite uh, to present at the summit. You know, I feel like don't mess with Aflatoon International. They are a very powerful organization and their voice will be heard. That's what we have learned from this. Congratulations, Roland. What a magnificent work. And I just want to, you know, talk with you and ask you as well to say, what is the relevance of the inclusion of that financial skills, right, in the vision statement of the UN Secretary General after the summit? And what does it mean for financial education worldwide? Yeah, it, it is really very important, Anna Maria. It, it, some people laugh at me and say, Ronald, it's two words, financial skills, but in a UN document, uh, who cares? But it is really very important. Everybody around the world is working and talking about the sustainable development goals, their frameworks, their strategies, the work they are doing. And so many sustainable development goals are related to financial education. We talk about SDG 1, poverty reduction. SDG 4, quality education, SDG 5, gender equality, SDG 8, decent work and economic growth. So many organizations, international organizations are working on these topics, but there is nowhere mentioning of financial education, while financial education are crucial components of, of these sustainable development goals. And because it's not mentioned in the sustainable development goals, it is not considered a priority. And the summit was a, a, a taking stock by the secretary general himself or, okay, we are not on track on SDG 4, we need to do something different. And it's not doing more, but we really need to do it, transform our response. So we need to come together and discuss what does a transformed education system look like. And in that statement, he said financial skills is part of that. So you can imagine it is now much easier to go to, to knock on the doors of governments, of international organizations, funders and, and uh, other key stakeholders and say oh listen financial skills is, is a key priority now and therefore it will be it's more than the two words in the document it, it will uh, go and live its own life thank you thank you we ne really need to celebrate that you know now this word financial skills is you know in the vision statement of the united nations secretary general i mean it's really such an achievement and First of all, I want to thank you, uh, Roland, uh, for also inviting GFLAC to present at the summit. Uh, we were able to share two presentations at the summit during the session that you organized. One was focused on financial education works, evidence and policy implication. And the second one was measuring financial literacy, a global perspective. And they are available on our webpage at the uh, www.gflag.org for those uh, who are listening and want to see the presentation. I just want to mention and ask you how relevant was to have research shared during the session? Yeah, I, I, I'd like to thank you as well for your input, uh, Anna Maria. The, the, the presentations from GFLAG were from strategic point very important. Uh, first of all, all, there are still people who are skeptical about the, uh, the effectiveness of financial education. You always have people who say, well, you, children need to learn it from their parents. But you know, the majority of, of parents don't know about money themselves. So how can children learn about it, specifically children living in poverty? So we really need to set one of the meeting very clearly that financial education works. And that's been such a remarkable work by yourself, Tim Kaiser and other researchers around the world who have documented and the, the, your, uh, your review about all these randomized control trials showing that it works, that we felt we need to really 
put it in the agenda and, and make the message very clear to everybody, financial education works and put it on the record in the United Nations. Now, we ask you to do a second presentation specifically strategically focusing on, on, on measurement and, and indicators. As, as uh, my, my senior colleague, uh, when I still work with UNICEF, always said, if you can't measure it, it's not important. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have seen, if you look at the priorities which have been taken on in the sustainable development goals, it's those strategies and interventions which have a measurable indicator so that people can report on it, can discuss progress and uh, compare countries uh, over time uh, and between regions. So we need to have an indicator. If you really want to take financial education to the level that it's being really used as an intervention within the transforming education agenda, you need to be able to report on it. You need to be able to, over time, you need to be able to compare between education systems countries. And since uh, there is, you clearly presented that there is a simple measurement, an indicator of three or five questions. And with that, we can assess if, if a child, is, a young person is financially literate, it's a fantastic indicator. And it's my hope that in future, in the, in the global UNESCO report, the UNICEF State of the Children reports, we will have that indicator on financial education, financial literacy, uh, something which all countries will be reporting on. It can be measured through simple surveys. Thank you. And I just want to mention to the people who are listening today that, you know, is this possible to measure financial literacy at the global level? This is just to show how universal it is. And we have a global survey, which we did in collaboration with the World Bank and uh, using Gallup. Um, so it's available on our website for people who want to know about this. To measure financial literacy among 15 years old, there is the data from PISA, the Program for International Student Assessment. So we have also international comparison of financial literacy for young people. Um, and also, as Roland has mentioned, we have done now a meta-analysis looking at evidence across 33 countries um, and, uh, you know, in many, uh, in a sense around the world about the financial education program. And then that paper is also available on our website for those of you who want to know about the effectiveness of financial education. But I want to continue a little bit on this research side, because as you said, it's very important, um, you know, for, for this and, you know, in a sense, what other type of research is needed to support the advocacy effort that uh, uh, no, to make financial education available worldwide. Yeah, that's that's uh, an interesting question. I, I guess uh, we need research both for advocacy, but also for effective programs on the ground. Of course, with all these three hundred plus partners, but also many other organizations out there working on financial education, and virtually the movement is growing. Uh, we need to make sure that we deliver quality to these, these young people as well. A couple of things uh, which come to the top of my mind is, is first of all, a, a better understanding of what are the most cost-effective financial education intervention in different settings. Uh, so what's the best age? What's the best usage uh, for the 30 year olds? How many lessons is minimum required and how many can be too many? Uh, also, we need to do more research on the long-term effects of financial literacy on people's lives. So, so really we can document how it is having impact later on in the lives of, of when we educate children. Um, also, it's important financial education within the broader financial inclusion agenda, how, how it is really helping the broader uh, fight to make sure more, more people are, are financially included. And then the relationship of saving activities within financial education is another important topic, at least for the Aflatron network. Mm -hmm. And just to continue on that, what should be some of the questions in the academia and research center that they should be working on to advance the cause in favor of financial education? Um, more evidence from different countries, more evidence uh, different age groups, I also think it would be important to have a better understanding on the relationship between students, schools, teachers, and parents. I think we also need to have a bigger discussion on, on financial education among teachers, because that's an important step as well in this whole discussion, of course. Uh, we have seen in, in a lot of countries that digital skills was a big issue uh, for teachers uh, during COVID, but there are also a lot of teachers who are financially illiterate, so that more research on how to best 
at a, at scale uh, we can educate uh, teachers. Um, at Aflatin, we are also specifically interested in, in vulnerable groups. And, and when we talk about financial education, we often talk about transition from school to work life, but there is also a transition from childhood to adulthood life. And, and a lot of adolescents, specifically adolescent girls, and today is the International Day of the Girl Child, a lot of adolescent girls are exposing a lot of risks uh, as they grow up. Uh, for example, teenage pregnancies, child marriage, HIV AIDS, and to what extent can financial education be a protective factor in, in as they grow up, these children? Uh, there, there is a growing, uh, there is some research by Nancy Lee on the combination, the, the importance of financial education to reduce HIV AIDS infection. And there have some be studies been done and it would be really good to see, can we do more research to see how the effectiveness is not only to increase, increase financial literacy, but also to reduce some of the other sustainable development goals on, on as I said, uh, communicable diseases and, and other uh, problems for, for, uh, for children and young people. And, and this evidence will be really very important uh, for a lot of other programs who are out there around the world who at the moment don't think about financial literacy, but actually financial literacy, as far as we see, is one of the key solutions to many of the other problems which are out there. Thank you, Roland. And I want to mention to everybody that now we have a network, uh, which is called the G53 Network on Financial Literacy and Financial Education. Um, go and look at that website. And we are having a working paper series. And exactly one of the first working paper is about an evaluation of a financial education program in Peru. And as you have mentioned, Roland, it actually talks about also the importance of uh, children's, not just children education, but also parents and teachers and how financial education affects everybody. And there are also important peer effects. So I want to mention that paper by Veronica Frisancho uh, as well. And it's very much in line with uh, this agenda. Um, and also I want to tell you that in the work we have done in Italy on financial literacy, we say financial literacy is a shield that protect people, uh, you know, against shocks. And I think, you know, that's another way in which I would describe financial literacy. As you said, you know, it's, it's protective. It's protective in particular for vulnerable groups. And I really want to turn to say, but how are organizations such as Aflatoon International making a difference in demonstrating that financial literacy works on the ground level? Yeah, at, at Aflatoon, we have a sort of two-pronged approach where, where on one side, we work with all these partners around the world and they are really focusing on interventions to, uh, to reach the most vulnerable children. Many of them work through schools, but also many work them to children who have already dropped out of schools. And, and um, by, by pro implementing these programs by these civil society organizations, we make sure that we reach the most vulnerable. But at the same time, of course, our dream is that every child, as it grows up, gets a, a solid package of financial education in, in its school life. And therefore, we're also really working on, on the integrating it into national education systems. So we work with a growing number of, of, of governments uh, around the world where we engage with them uh, on in, including social uh, and financial education into their national curriculum. And uh, this is, of course, takes time, you need to convince the, the Ministry of Education. Often the central banks are a very helpful ally in, in this process. And once they, they are interested, we then take them to our local partner who is actually already implementing financial education for children on the ground. And once they see these programs, they get enthusiastic and we start the process of, uh, of the integration into the national curriculum. Great. You know, so Roland, what potential obstacle um, financial education needs to address to be a priority at the policy maker level, right? Because, uh, you know, we have seen that, you know, there are lots of obstacles and, you know, what is your suggestion on how to overcome them, given your experience in working with so many countries and also your success? Yeah. Uh, the many challenges. Uh, <laughs> it, 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 it has been for many of us an uphill battle because financial education until recently was not recognized as a priority. And again, that's why it's so important that we have it on the international agenda. 
But I, I think that in, in many uh, of your listeners who are also in, in, involved in, in working with governments is that the first response when you go to a Ministry of Education is saying, listen, our curriculum is already too full. Don't come with another subject. We don't, we, we can't, we need to cut rather. So I, I do think that uh, we need to be pragmatic as financial education uh, sector and we need to engage with, uh, with governments, with ministries of education. And, and if they are not able to have a standalone subject of financial education, have a discussion with them on infusing it into existing subjects. Because in a way you can make your existing subject more interesting and more relevant. A very simple example is when you teach children about percentages, you can also teach them about uh, interest rates. And, and there are many other examples where we see in, in the countries where we work at least with, uh, with governments that you can infuse it quite nicely in different subjects. And actually in different countries, they look at different subjects to infuse financial education. And in that way, it's also at the same time mainstreamed in examinable subjects. So in that way, you can also make sure that it's not a, an uh, extracurricular approach, but it's really an, a mainstream uh, approach. So that's the first uh, challenge. The, the second challenge is once we are successful in integrating it into the national education system, there is, of course, a cost of reorienting the teachers is training all these teachers in the new curriculum is a very costly exercise and whatever you all happens in the classroom is only as good as the teacher who is standing in front of the classroom uh, so uh, teaching them new teaching skills uh, new learning and teaching methods has to be done and planned well uh, in advance uh, with the government budget but also finding important strategic international donors who are willing to take on the tap of that because like an organization of Aflatoon would not be able to do that so you need to really have a partnership you also need to engage the private sector in some countries the private sector is a good partner in doing that so that's the second challenge building the capacity of the the teachers uh, workforce and then of course the, the third uh, challenge remains uh, establishment in the education sector at global and at national level, uh, many people who are at the moment in charge of the education sector would like to continue what they are doing at the moment. And, and therefore, again, it's so important that we have this on the agenda. And the, the few people uh, who, who want to change, they want to change towards climate change. But we need to really get repeat and reiterate financial skills. You need to talk about financial skills. Of course, every child needs to learn to read and write. And that's top priority. But the moment they can read and write and count, you need to teach them about finance. There are hundreds of thousands, uh, actually there are two, more than 200 million children who are not completing their basic education around the world. Imagine, they will never get a job with the government. They will not have a diploma. At least you need to teach them a little bit about money so that they can take care of, take care of themselves if they drop out of schools. Aside from all those people who, who finish their education, who have no clue when they go into the labor market. So you can hear it from me and I'm sure you agree with me. It's financial education. We need to repeat it from now on again and again with this new document. Absolutely. Financial literacy empowers people um, to do, you know, to, to, to be able to operate in society the we see this as to participate to society. And I have to say now they are also, you know, be able to be better citizen, understand this difficult policy that, you know, we are implementing, understand, for example, how to deal with inflation that is, uh, you know, um, happening and it's affecting all of us uh, more than ever. You know, financial literacy is an important skill, and I have to say the work that Aflatoon is doing is just so impressive. And, you know, because of what you said, uh, you know, I just want to, again, point on what should be the top priority in the advocacy and research agenda to bring policies in favor of financial education to the next level. You know, we have done so much, you know, how can we bring it to the next level? Well, first of all, I think we all need to now continue to speak and knock on all the doors of all the policymakers around the world and remind them financial, the UN Secretary General is saying financial skills is part of the new transformative agenda. So please let's engage on this and let's have a discussion on this. Strategically, um, the most important point at the moment, and it brings it a bit back on the discussion we had before on the indicator and the measurement, it is really important that we now measure around the world what is the financial literacy level among 
children and young people. We, we have, you have presented at the summit so clearly that it is a, a simple indicator. The surveys can be done probably at school level, so it's not too expensive. And we basically need to get an, an, a baseline now for 2022, 2023, uh, to know the, 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 the state of financial literacy country by country for children and young people around the world and then really start uh, monitoring progress. So it's not only my wish and my dream, but I really think it's a priority for the financial education sector. Is, is, let's try to see, come together as, as a group of stakeholders and see if we can pull off an, an international uh, tool. Of course, there is fantastic work done by PISA and OECD and build on that experience, uh, work with them and others to, and hopefully we will be able to find a funder or two to make this happen. It shouldn't be too expensive, but once we have that baseline and we have that information, uh, and, and of course there was this Standard & Poor uh, survey done in 2014, you mentioned before, but, but that's more than seven years ago. We really need to have information uh, on children and young people. What is What are their financial skills? And as soon as we get that going, we will be able to uh, encourage also then the, the UN agencies to report on it in their global reports. And that way we, we get moving because we really need to get those documentations of, of the skill uh, skills level uh, available around the world. Yes, I want to mention um, that as well. First of all, our global survey done at the global level with more than 140 countries is still the only global survey of adults around the world. We include people 16 and older. So, you know, we go in a sense, we do cover some of the young, but you know, that data was 2014. So we need to update that. And, you know, I really hope, uh, as you are saying, that we are going to fund a visionary funder that is able to support the, this project without being able to compare countries. You know, we are not really able to make progress. And I have to tell you that each week there is an article mentioned in that survey. It is that successful. Uh, you know, when people need to report the data, they look at that survey. But, you know, now it is dated. We need to do more. For the young, I want to repeat what Roland said. We need to measure financial literacy among the young because then we want to give information and data to the Ministry of Education. And I want to mention that in 2025, the PISA data will not be collected. The last uh, data collection will be 2022. We hope to resume it in 2028, but there is a big gap now. So, you know, all countries, I want you to know that, you know, you cannot measure uh, in that, you know, official way via PISA, the financial literacy of your 15 years old. We need, uh, in a sense, to fill that gap. And we want certainly the OECD to continue and to expand the number of countries. You know, there they are about 20, 25. These are not all countries around the world, but every child around the world needs to have financial education in school. And we want to assess how they are learning how we can do better and how to measure success. So I want to join uh, Roland in this call for action and getting data and information so we can be more effective. So thank you, Roland. There are lots of questions. So I want to turn to these questions now. And one is just um, information um, and uh, you know, they ask, where is the research on the effectiveness of financial education? So let me say it again. Uh, it is posted on our web page, which is www.gflac.org. There is a rotating panel, there are rotating banners, so you'll be able to find it. But if you go under research as well, you'll find it. And it is actually a paper published in the Journal of Financial Economics. But we have also built a website with a summary of that research. The paper is very technical, very long, with a lot of appendices, but uh, also with the help of FINRA Investor Education Foundation and NIFI, which I really thank. We have written kind of a brief. Um, so there are also, um, you know, shorter articles that describe the main result. And we have also done presentation, including the one we did at the United Nations, which is also posted on our website under presentation. Um, so I hope you'll be able to find it. Um, so there is a question here that says, how does digitalization affect financial education and financial literacy? 
Do you have some insight about that? It, it affects it in, in, in two large ways. It's in a very important question. First of all, of course, is, is digital finance itself, digitalization. I mean, when you look at the Afla 2 material 10 years ago, we were talking about piggy banks. And now, of course, even uh, young people and, and uh, all the children have uh, mobile phones in, in, uh, in most of the countries. So, uh, first of all, it's, it's the content of the financial education is, 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 uh, is changing very rapidly because of uh, different uh, how the digital finance world is, 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 is rapidly developing on a, on a daily basis. Secondly, of course, is, is the teaching and using the digital skills to, to educate and reach children in a, in, a, in a different way or in a supplementary way. And uh, of course, COVID uh, has helped us very rapidly to change and innovate uh, in, in digital education ways. And what we have seen is that uh, uh, the use of games is, is one opportunity, but then there is also really the, the use of, of uh, what we are focusing on is, is using digital education and dig uh, on teachers. So at the moment we are really, trying to reach more teachers through the digital way uh, in teaching them how to te financial teaching them about financial education but then for them to teach financial education in the classroom even if it's face to face so it's a very effective way to reach many more teachers and many more classrooms by reaching uh, more uh, more teachers and then of course we have a number uh, of of countries where children are directly accessing uh, uh, financial education through digital platforms. So it, it's a very broad spectrum uh, and it is a, it creates a, enormous opportunities. Of course, we need to make sure that we don't get a, 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 a separation that again, the most vulnerable because of the digital divide are, are staying behind. But what we are seeing at the moment is by focusing on the teachers to reach them through digital means uh, about digital finance, but about financial education in general, and having them then reach the children face to face is a very effective way. Thank you, thank you very much. And this is another question, which uh, you know is very important, which is that uh, how effective, uh, at least according to your experience, it is infusing financial education into key subjects such as English, math, science. Yeah, we, we have an, uh, an, an increasing number of, uh, of countries which are infusing it uh, at the moment. This is really an area of, of where research needs to be, uh, is really required. We, we, we have done an, uh, a few smaller studies on, on the infusing in, in these types of subjects, but we are very keen to, uh, to, to look at uh, the effectiveness. We, we have uh, a randomized control uh, trial where we are looking at infusing it into existing subsystems, uh, comp uh, subjects, comparing it with extracurricular extra uh, activities. But we would really would looking forward to work with uh, researchers around the world to do much more work in this area. So I don't have a straightforward answer, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's something that we are all kind of trying, right? And maybe yeah. this is try to overcome the problem that the curricula are already so crowded, right? So can we put it in the other subject? You know, the question is, do people learn and learn well, you know, when it is infused in other subjects, right? So it's a really important research question. Um, so I'm going actually to take the question as they come, uh, rather, you know, rather than maybe having, uh, you know, follow up. Uh, uh, so and please send us your questions. You know, we are we have received quite a few, but, you know, we probably be able to uh, add a, a, even a few more than we have received. There is a very, very um, important question here, and I'm, I'm looking forward to your answer, which is how how is financial education, how financial education might help in filling income inequality, in addressing income inequalities? What do you think uh, is the role of financial education there? Uh, very important. It is, uh, you have documented uh, together with the other researchers how effective financial education is and that it works. If you think about uh, until very recently, the perspective has been, the perception has been in many cultures and many countries around the world that you learn about finance, about your 
uh, from your parents. I mean, in many countries, uh, talking about finance is a bigger taboo than sexuality education to a certain extent. And, and uh, that is, of course, an, uh, very risky because if you are expected to learn it from your parents and if you talk about uh, the, the low income countries, but also middle income countries and poorer segments in high income countries, these people are partly living in poverty, at least because these, these parents are not financially literate. And if we're now expecting that these children are learning financial literacy from their uh, financial skills from their parents, then there is no hope for these children, to be honest. So really integrating financial education in the education system is a much more fairer distribution uh, and opportunities for, for the children. So that the children who are uh, living, uh, their, who parents are less affluent, are also more likely to gain these skills. And therefore, it, it, it has a positive impact on income uh, inequalities, is, is, is my perspective. Absolutely. We always say we need to democratize financial education, yes, right? Yeah, because if you look at the financial literacy, the people who have it, the people who are financially literate are disproportionately the privileged groups. And we need to make the access to financial education available to everybody. And this is why we need it in the schools. That's the most important way to kind of, you know, uh, level playing field in terms of financial education. So, you know, I, I so much agree with what you said. Um, so here is a, another important question uh, uh, that, uh, yeah, you know, uh, will... Uh, we will benefit from your experience in working with so many countries, which is where to start. Should we target Minister of Education or Minister of Finance? Uh, or central banks, I would say. It, it's a very important question. Uh, the, our experience with Aflatoon is that often when we knock on the door called on the Ministry of Education, they will tell us, go in the back of the line. There are so many other curricula, extracurricula things people want to join. It's, uh, we don't have time for you. The, opp the, the opportunity actually is, is that the central banks have in their mandate as well uh, financial education. And central banks really feel they need to do something, but they often don't really know how to deal with it and what to do with financial education, specifically for children and young people. So while we are sometimes getting a kick in our butt when we knock on the door in the Ministry of Education, when we knock on the door on the central bank, they hug us and kiss us and say, where have you been? We, we really want to talk to you. And as you know, the reality is, is in, the, in the politics in most countries, a central bank is more powerful than the Ministry of Education. So the central bank takes us back down to the Ministry of Education and they say, let's talk and sit around the table. At the same time, we have our Aflatoon partners in the field implementing already programs. So we take the central bank and the Ministry of Education together to show a live program and then they get enthusiastic. And then you get to hook them and, and get the process going. You need to talk to all of them. Also talk to the private sector. They also have an important role to play and can be an important ally. Uh, but the central bank is definitely an, an opportunity to, to, to consider in, in this process. Yeah. So, you know, as you know, there is the meeting of the IMF and the World Bank here at, uh, in Washington DC at the moment. And I've spoken to so many governors who have, are becoming very uh, passionate about financial literacy. This morning, I met the governor of the Central Bank of Cyprus, which are you know, one of the country, which is also doing a national strategy on financial literacy. And, you know, again, you know, you can see, you know, that perhaps, you know, you, you don't see central uh, governor to be passionate uh, normally, but they seem to be passionate about financial literacy. So that's very important. I would like to say, you know, there is also an issue of financial stability that is important. And so I think it's important for the central bank to foster this topic because it, it really benefits the central bank and the country and the economy. And the yeah. Ministry of Finance as well. In Italy, it was the Ministry of Finance who actually established the Financial Education Committee. So often, you know, you have visionary leaders like our minister, Minister Padoan, in Italy, who started the Financial Education Committee. So, you know, I want to um, continue on that because they say, you know, how can... Um, how can, in a sense, this work help the national strategies? Uh, 
Um, so in fact, the specific question is how the groundwork uh, that institution like Aflatoon does can support uh, the national strategies on financial education. In, in principle, it, it, Aflatoon partners are in many countries uh, participating in these national financial inclusion strategies. That's how they are often mm -hmm. called in, in many countries. And mm -hmm. um, it's, it's sharing the experiences. What we are seeing in, uh, in, in, in more and more countries is that we have multiple Aflatoon partners on the ground. As, I mean, we, we have over 300 partners, as, as, you, as you are aware. So what we also do is we bring those partners at country level together to share experiences, but together they're also a stronger voice into, into the national dialogue on financial inclusion. So it is in, uh, in principle, uh, the NGOs and uh, cooperatives and microfinance institutions who, who are partner of, of, of Aflatoon, they come together at, at country level and then uh, engage uh, with the government entities uh, on, on the topic. And to be honest, in 90% in of all our work we are doing, our civil society and NGOs are working closely together with uh, ministries of education, even if it's a district level or local level, because you have to have that uh, engagement with uh, the authorities if you want to have uh, approved interventions in, in schools. And here is a related question, uh, given your experience, Roland, in which region can we find policymaker committed to the, this agenda and there is, is there, did you notice a difference between the developed and developing countries? Um, you, you also, you, you mentioned it yourself, you always have in some countries champions who are really important for you in this process. Yeah. And it's of course for us to make uh, more senior policymakers champions on, uh, on the topic. We are seeing actually in all regions a, a very rapidly growing appetite for financial education. Of course, uh, sadly, but an opportunity for us, uh, COVID has been a, 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 key, uh, a key reason. Uh, there is a growing realization around the world that families are not resilient enough and the fact that they are not have the financial skills is, is a key, key uh, factor for that. So it has been an opportunity to engage with many more uh, governments. We, I, I, can, uh, I can mention the region, but to be honest, all regions uh, in, in, in the world from Latin America to uh, Southeast Asia and all the regions in between, they are all uh, rapidly engaging uh, in, in that field. On the, the difference between developing and developed countries, there are subtle differences. Um, it's also with who you interact, uh, often in... Um, in, in the developing countries, we work really with grassroots organizations at, who are really immediately in, in, having interventions in the communities, while in some of the more developed countries, we have uh, organizations which are higher up in, in, the, in, the, in the field of policy making. Interestingly enough, uh, we have a package Afla Tot, which is for preschool children. And that is the most popular in the more developed countries. So in Europe, and uh, we, we, that is the, by far the most popular topic. It's partly also because there are many other organizations aside from Aflatoon operating in these countries who are, the, who are there and are leading the financial education. But uh, interestingly enough, in, in these countries, uh, Aflatoon is being often approached to do our Aflatot program for five, uh, to three, four, five, six-year-olds. You know, uh, interestingly, you know, when I visited uh, or when we talk about some of the policymaker, I have found this incredible passion for financial literacy, in particular in developing countries. And I think they really recognize how important financial literacy is. Um, and so it's a very exciting development. And I have to say that according to our meta-analysis, financial education works and works in the same way in developing and developed countries. And this is a result that surprised us because we thought, you know, developing countries have a lot of issues, you know, issue about even education and having good education. But in fact, there are, you know, no differences or not measurable differences across country level of income and so on. So financial education works and works worldwide. 
there are more questions here. We cannot address all of them, but I hope that we have been able to, at least uh, with this discussion, uh, giving you some ideas of the amazing work that Aflatoon is doing and that you know we can bring this topic to the global agenda. So I want to turn to you, maybe Roland, for some closing you know, remarks. You know, what do you want everybody that is listening today to kind of take away? And perhaps, you know, what can they do to join this effort to bring financial education to the global stage? Thank you so much, first of all, Ana Maria, for having me. Um, the most important point is, as you said, financial education works. It's being implemented as we speak in many different countries. Um, it is uh, scalable and it is sustainable. And uh, we, this is only the beginning. The fact that uh, financial skills is, is highlighted by the UN Secretary General, we as stakeholders in financial education, we need to remind everybody now, again, every day in our work, that this is part of the new transformative, uh, edu transforming education agenda, because otherwise it will slip and people will only talk about the other priorities, which are also important, but without financial education, uh, really, we are not going to achieve the sustainable development goals. So we need to push, push, push. I think I'm going to leave it with that. Uh, push, push, push. You know, we need to bring financial education to the global agenda. It takes uh, uh, the work of all of us to do so. We, we can all be ambassador for financial literacy. I always say, ask it in your school, ask it in your workplace, make sure it is provided in the community in which you live because financial education works and it is an essential skill to live and thrive in the 21st century. Thank you very much, the CEO of Aflatoon, Roland Monash, and thank you to all of those that were here with us today and see you soon at the next webinar. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.